welcome to the Transforming Trauma podcast. Transforming Trauma is presented by the NARM Training Institute. I'm your host, Emily Ruth, and I'm so glad you've joined us today. Hi, Transforming Trauma listeners. If you're a licensed mental health professional working with complex trauma and are interested in learning the neuroaffective relational model, we're excited to share with you about our upcoming NARM therapist trainings. The level two NARM therapist training is a clinical training designed for licensed mental health professionals, current mental health graduate students, and active clinical interns and trainees, where you will get trained in a comprehensive developmental framework and clinical approach for resolving the long-term impacts of ACEs and CPTSD. As you are learning and integrating NARM, you will receive individualized support from a team of skilled, passionate, and supportive trainers led by NARM senior faculty, Brad Kammer. If you're interested in learning to support the healing of complex trauma, we encourage you to register now to reserve your spot. For more information and to register, please visit www.narmtraining.com forward slash schedule. And now for our interview. Peter Monson is completing his clinical mental health counseling degree after switching careers from years in public service and nonprofit work. Peter specializes particularly in military, combat, and religious trauma work. Please enjoy this conversation with Peter Monson. All right. Welcome, Peter, to the podcast. It's great to have you here on Transforming Trauma. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. Yeah. So I'd like if we could just hear from you a little bit about what you're hoping for listeners to get out of our conversation today. Yeah, I think if I could have listeners get anything, first it would be that anyone in the military, whoever they are, maybe especially from the trauma standpoint, that PTSD isn't just from kicking down doors and blowing stuff up. Right. There's lots of different ways to get it from the military and it can come from outside of the military while you're in it and before the military. Okay. And I appreciate you naming that because even folks who have not been in the military, all of us probably know someone who has been in the military at some point or had some kind of experience. So that's important for all of us to know and understand more about that. For sure. So can you tell us a little bit about you, where you grew up? the work that you're doing in the field of complex trauma? Yeah, I'd love to. So like all of us, I have a unique story, I guess. Mm -hmm. I uh, was multi-generational LDS, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I guess, for those of who don't know what the acronym is, also known as Mormon from a religious standpoint. My parents, my mother was, uh, my father was not. And that brings some some multi-generational trauma and struggles and some supportive background. They had me very young. There was some some challenges there. They had my little brother as well. Uh, my father ended up being incarcerated. And my mother tried to raise us on her own. When that didn't work, she was persuaded to put us into a adoption program that the LDS church has, or had at the time, rather. I don't know if they still have it. And we were adopted into another LDS family. And because of the traumas, psycho situations that were present in that family and in that set of parents, I underwent a lot of religious trauma, a lot of physical trauma, emotional trauma as a child that went undocumented, untreated, as did my brothers. I I was lucky enough to be adopted with my younger brother, biological brother, into a family that had two sons. And so all of us brothers close grew up kind of in a survival state and married young, as is expected in the LDS culture, and joined the military. Language has always been something that has been very natural to me. I can't do math to save my life, but I can talk to people. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also very much expected for young men in the LDS culture to go on what are called missions. And oftentimes those are international. So you pick up a language there too. So I had a couple languages under my belt that I was adept at, went into the military and did intelligence work. I was a human intelligence agent. I tested out of German and tested into Chinese Mandarin, and I became an interrogator and 
human intelligence agent, which is where I would go and get intelligence for special forces teams, gather that while undercover, and then the expectation of our job was to get it by any means possible, get it to the special forces teams, and they would do what they're known for doing. Then uh, the somatic traits started popping up, Mm. and one day I fell in the middle of a field and had seizures at Mm. the height of my physical aptitude out of nowhere. I was 26, 27, and started having 12 to 15 seizures a day, grand mal, petite mal, and uh, started taking me and my wife at the time down this road of looking at what does somatic response mean. I had another, you know, job at the time, obviously with the military. She is a fantastic clinician. She is a doctor of physical therapy. And so she really got into things over the years. I went and did a, a master's in public administration, started working for the government, local, nonprofit. And she started looking at the somatic, psychosomatic, as well as how it integrated into women's health. Mm. And one day came upon NARM. And NARM is kind of one of the things that has really changed a lot of things in her practice. And then when COVID hit, a lot of government stuff shut down, as as a lot of folks are aware. Mm. And I was sitting at my cubicle saying, what am I doing with my life? I really miss doing something that I'm passionate about. And I said, I I miss helping people, interacting with people. I don't necessarily want to do it in a way where I'm interrogating people anymore, but I do miss talking to them. So (laughs) I could probably apply that in a better way. And I went back and got a second master's uh, or started on it. I'm I'm finishing it up right now. So I started a clinical mental health counseling masters and my wife at the time said hey narm has been helping you you should look into it and Mm. narm started there for me so wow if i can just sort of pause there and just share my appreciation of like your shift from literally using your skills to talk to people in a in a sense of needing to interrogate them to switching to a field where you're really showing up to support that really strikes me as as a as an important part of your journey. I'm so curious about that. You know, what your process was to decide to move into the field. You know, we talk about trauma bringing up survival. And if I'm going to talk about my own shift, it was easier for me to be doing um, this kind of nasty interrogation spy work. Mm-hmm because it was that little boy who was trying to survive than it was trying to be a husband, trying to be a father, trying to be working out in communities, trying to grow them. So that shift really came from getting out of the military where those survival skills were no longer useful and saying, whoa, the world doesn't need this? Then what? how do I interact with the world again? Mm. And that really was the shift. It was it was a re-survival, if that's a term I could use. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. That's when I realized, okay, I need to stop being this really toxic person because the world doesn't need my toxicity. I don't need my toxicity. People I love don't need my toxicity. And that's also not to say that that's not with a lot of hard nights and hard conversations, right? It wasn't just me waking up one day and realizing it. That, that's a lot of a lot of tough situations. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so you're sharing as you're going through this personal shift, at what point did you decide to become trained in NARM? And was that, I mean, where in that, you know, process was that decision for you? I go to a university online that is highly religious. And a lot of the schoolwork that they do is around religion. They help out veterans with the cost of the school which is extremely kind of them, especially me being a disabled veteran. Mm. They give a a great discount. However, they are very strict in what they do. And oftentimes the solution to the point at which your client reaches a stuck point of 
their trauma is, wow, you really got to turn them towards God. That was expressing this concern to, to peers who are clinicians, to my former spouse who's a clinician, and saying, hey, this doesn't seem right. There, there's got to be something internal because religion can't be the solution to folks who aren't religious or just to folks who are religious, but maybe religion hasn't done everything for them. Mm. And what modalities can I, can I use? And that's really when NARM stood out as a, a practical culmination of different theories of different modalities that could really be applicable. Mm. I really appreciate that because I think, you know, something I've heard from other clinicians who are practicing NARM is this idea that there's space for that if that's what the client is is wanting and needing. And they may journey their way to that, but but that that's not our job as a clinician to direct them in that way if that's not where their agency leads them to go. So I'm just really appreciating your you know, that as a, you know, being still in school, that you were already asking these questions of like, this doesn't feel, something about this doesn't feel right. Something about this doesn't feel aligned with really supporting the client where they're at. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, you know, especially in the community that I live and the culture that I grew up in, there are a lot of people who are transitioning out of religion. And there's a lot of people who are trying to find their space within their religion mm -hmm. and really redefine what it means to be spiritual or religious and deal with their traumas. And NARM seems to give them that space, whether they want to stay in or go out. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Oh, that's so beautiful. So I'm wondering, you mentioned that you're finishing up school now. And so I wonder if you're, you're in a clinical setting, I'm guessing, and, and how do you see yourself using NARM now with clients? I work in a facility that I absolutely adore. It is part of Salt Lake Behavioral Health, it is a program called Strong Hope. And what they do is they take folks from all over the country, all over the world, who are currently members of the military or recently veterans, and give them a space to kind of find a baseline when they've had a traumatic experience or are just really struggling, come in to an inpatient setting and give them 30 days typically to stay inpatient, go through some really holistic therapeutic settings and use modalities such as CBT, DBT, EMDR, rec therapy, group therapy, and really just give them the best treatment possible to find that emotional baseline so they can go back out and find the continuous care that they need. And I love that you're bringing NARM into that, <laughs> into that grouping of, of all those modalities that, that there's a place for, but also that you're bringing this, this lens and, and way of working with your patients. You know, I have to say, and if, if there's anybody who's a student who's listening, I have not found a place with any of those modalities, any of the modalities that I've learned in school where NARM doesn't fit kind of as like a glue in between the cracks, mm -hmm. if that's a good analogy. Yeah, that's great. It, it just seems like the more I learn about Adler, the more I learn about, you know, DBT, the Linehan, the more I learn about CPT, the more I learn about EMDR. It's just like, oh, okay, I can see where, you know, Brad said this. And, oh, okay, it made sense. Or, you know, I see where we had <laughs> this, you know, where somebody told me not to say this this way, and it really was frustrating. However, because of Adler, yeah, I'm not going to say this. And, oh, somebody was just taking bits and pieces and putting it together in a really applicable way. And I can see in school, I can see in my internship where I'm showing up with tools and other Therapists are saying, hey, you're, you're really advanced at this. I really appreciate how you're showing up. And I'm, I'm not basking in it. What I'm saying is, oh, yeah, and there's this great modality that totally taught me because this has nothing to do with me. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody taught me how to do this really well. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I, I, really, I really enjoy the, the training that Norm has given me along with my education. Yeah. 
I wonder, because you mentioned, well, you talked about your, your background and your childhood and growing up, and you talked about some of the familial trauma, but then also this piece of religious trauma. And I wondered if you would be open to talking more about that. Yeah, definitely. In my mind, I'm thinking about, you know, experiencing all of this developmental trauma and then moving into the military and how that, you know, we often hear that the shock trauma, one-time event trauma, or shorter term trauma, PTSD can sort of trigger all of the developmental trauma. And so I'm wondering if for you, how those things correlated or if you noticed, if that's the first thing I'm wondering is if you noticed the the complex trauma, the developmental trauma as you went out into the field. Yeah, um, I guess I feel like I always have to tell a story to answer a question. So yeah. I, no, that's great. Okay, so when we talk about familial trauma with me, it mostly stems from my mother. She had her own issues going on, but they presented mostly around religion. And so first, I want to caveat that not everyone's LDS religious experience is like this. But unfortunately, there are a lot. My first memory that I have of my mother, so I was adopted and I was almost six years old when I was adopted. First memory I have of my mother was her beating me because she thought I was lying And I said I wasn't lying. And then she beat me even more because she thought that Joseph Smith, who's the founder of the LDS religion, wouldn't lie to his mother this way. Hmm. So when I got into the military, I realized, okay, there's an expectation here. It's just like there was with my mother. It's not Hmm. necessarily just about not doing the right thing. It's about meeting the expectation and looking the right way. So lying was easy because I had been doing it to meet an expectation since, you know, six years old. Yeah, to survive. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then when it was going out into the field and putting a mask on to play a different part of another person to get information, and granted, I, I wasn't. I was only in the military for four years. There's people who do it for 20. However, for the, the short time that I was in and doing it, it was easy until the questions started popping up of like, wait, why, why do I really need to do this? Some of the questions about morals started popping up. You know, oh, we're doing this to meet the expectation of a country, but this is against the word of God. And that started creating trauma. That started creating PTSD, right? For one example, it is a well-known fact that a lot of people in the intelligence community are LDS, right? You need a group of young, healthy people without tattoos who speak second languages and don't have criminal records that can be looked at. You can go to LDS folks. However... Other countries know that, and so the first thing they'll do is offer you alcohol. The LDS church is very against alcohol, but if you're in the intelligence community, they'll teach you, okay, you got to drink. So then it starts creating these questions of, well, how is this okay with God if I can do it for the U.S.? This is what I was talking about earlier. Is like PTSD is not just kicking down doors and shooting people and blowing stuff up. Yeah. It can also just be moral quandaries within self. Mm. Wow, I've never thought of it quite like that. But that makes so much sense that there's this internal dilemma that feels so intense, I imagine. I mean, I'm just hearing how you're describing it. That sounds like a really intense experience. And so, you know, this concept of that that actually creates post-traumatic stress, that's, that's just not a framing I've quite thought about like that before. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's one religion. That's one job. Mm -hmm. And so if you extrapolate that out to the entirety of the military, you know, there's people who have these core values and they're going out and they're having to bump them up against war, up against service in other countries where they can't do something because it's against the the directive. You know, how, Mm. how does that feel waking up knowing, Hey, I could stop a problem, but I'm told I can't, you know, these are, these are really big quandaries that people have. Yeah. And day after day, you got to do it. Yeah. And I'm thinking back to to how you described um, your experience with your mother and being beaten for 
basically abandoning, you had, you learned that you had to abandon your authentic self in order to survive those moments and kind of survive the relationship in your, your whole childhood, the impact of that and how that popped up later on in the work that you did. That's, yeah, that's really profound. Yeah. I think too, trying to fit in was a big one oftentimes. And again, I can only speak from my own experience. Oftentimes there can be a lot of inauthentic hate that is expected. You know, oh, there's the enemy. What does the enemy look like? We shouldn't like, or we shouldn't accept people that look like this. We shouldn't accept people that talk like this. Like, I didn't think I was necessarily came into a scenario in the military where I cared about folks that looked or spoke or acted a certain way, right? However, I came out of the military not liking a certain group of people that I'd really never even met or in, interacted with. But it was, again, because of the expectation. It was the same in my religious childhood upbringing. There were certain groups of folks that I was told don't like those people, don't like those people with tattoos. Mm. I have tattoos today, right? Like, I always wanted tattoos, but I always knew that those people were evil. You know, like, <laughs> it's just mm. meeting an expectation that's implied on you can cause trauma as well, because it's like you said, the, the rejection of the authentic self. Yeah. And I'm just imagining, you know, for you as a, as a young man, and, and again, I don't, you said everyone's experience inside any religion is probably really different, but I'm imagining, you know, being taught things like, you know, God wants us to love people, but then this conflicting message that you're <laughs> receiving of like, but not these people <laughs> don't, exactly. don't accept or hang out with these people because there's a, you know, so I'm just kind of holding that the dilemma there as a young man that you must have experienced too. Yeah. It's funny because especially in the, the Western Judeo-Christian mindset of God that I had, which extrapolated out was, could have been a very great self-identification of myself, was God wants me to love everybody and be really kind to everybody. But God's really trying to meet an expectation, isn't he? Whose expectation? God's failing all the time because he never meets this expectation and he doesn't know what it is. God hates a lot of people, and he doesn't even know why he hates them. Why would I worship this God? And then it goes into, well, why would I even love myself? Right. Because if, if I can't meet expectations, if I can't love myself because I can't meet the expectation because the expectation doesn't even exist because I don't even know what it is, then where am I even going to go in all of this? Yeah. Yeah, which really plays in pretty quickly to that, like the self-hatred, the self-shaming, the ways that we can show up as humans and reject ourselves. That kind of belief that I'm hearing you describe just fits really, <laughs> really quickly into that piece of rejecting the self and hating the self. Very much so. Yeah. Well, and it makes it really tough too to get a contract mm. because I see a lot of people say, well, I don't want anything because I don't deserve anything. Yeah. Because who am I? And I think that sometimes can be tough. And, and I, I asked Brad about that too multiple times when I was training with him and I got the opportunity to, was if someone doesn't even know themselves, why would they want anything? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a really interesting question to ask too. Because mm -hmm. if they don't want anything, then what are they, what are they looking for? And I think that's a tough question, too, of how do you ask someone who's showing up to therapy, what do you want? I oftentimes ask, what do you not want? Hmm. Or what would you want if you weren't you? Oh, wow. Huh. For folks listening who maybe aren't familiar with the terminology of the contract, can you describe what you're, what you're referring to? Because you just said it. You just named it of what is it that you're wanting? Yes. Yeah, I I'm probably not going to define this as Norm would define it. However, the contract oftentimes between the clinician and the client can be when a client comes in to do work, it's what the client contracts to work towards, what they want to do to change in their life. And when that's identified, 
the clinician can provide the structure to help the client find their way there. Yeah. Which really just points to this whole piece of consent. Like we want to make sure that we're working toward what it is the client is actually wanting and and that they're sharing that. So I appreciate you diving into that a little bit more. So if the client doesn't really even know themselves, how can they know what it is that they're wanting to be able to contract with us and, and share, you know, in consent around what it is that they're wanting to work toward? That's, that's a tough question. It sounds like a simple question, but most clients really struggle with that. And I think you're naming exactly why, because a lot of us don't know ourselves very well when we start this work. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it's tough, especially for those who have experienced some kind of religious trauma for the reason that God or gods are often representative of ourselves. Mm. And so when one is taught that the God is who you are and you no longer know the God, then not knowing the self becomes oftentimes very natural. Mm. Not knowing the self becomes natural. Wow. I wondered, because you mentioned earlier, or at least maybe it was just me kind of drawing some parallels around what you described as growing up in, in the church and then moving toward and working in a government setting, that there's kind of two organizations, that there's some overlap. These LDS missionaries kind of coming straight out of the, the mission field, it sounds like, and being plunked right down into an a organization in, in the government. I'm just curious if, you know, what... Do we go out two by two knocking doors yeah. and asking, hey, do you want to hear about the U.S. military? Yeah, yeah, yeah kind I'm, of. I mean, I'm wondering, you know, like what similarities did you experience? And, and was that confusing at all? Did it feel somehow comforting? Yeah, there was tons of crossover. Yeah, uh, you do go out two by twos. You go out with a partner in, in my job. But I mean, you get a rigid schedule. You get short haircuts. You get told what to do. You get told when to wake up, when to eat. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a lot of crossover. I think the biggest thing, though, and I've talked to other people who are still in and other people who have gotten out and are LDS or not LDS friends, and then we talk about this, wanting that brotherhood, wanting that family, wanting that place where we fit. And it was given to you, right? You earned it. You came in as nothing and you got something and you got it together. There was that trauma bonding and then you got it together and they gave you a family and they gave you purpose. And I think that's why when, and again, speaking for myself, I think that's why when I got out and I realized that my community didn't need what I had, I was so tough was because I had had a community that needed what I had. And I had a brotherhood and I had a purpose, just like when I did in the mission field, just like when I did in the military. And then I got out and I was like, oh, this is, this is not the world that I was promised. And in my discussions with my fellow veterans, that's often a very similar feeling. It's just, I don't belong mm -hmm. because all my family, all my, you know, brothers and sisters are out in a world that I recognize and I don't recognize this one. And so community focused therapies and kind of injecting people back in can be super helpful to the psyche. Yeah. I've, I've talked to a few clinicians who are working with NARM in groups mm -hmm. and I just have so much appreciation for exactly what you're naming, like that collective experience and really being with each other and, you know, the relationality, which is such a huge, that's the R and NARM is the, the relational aspect. And so, yeah, I'm really appreciating this piece that you're talking about of sort of feeling out of the circle when we're, you know, there's an ejection sort of from the group and like the grief that comes with that and how traumatic that can be. Yeah. One of the things that I struggled with when I started my internship here because NARM was really kind of the only modality that I had learned before I started my internship was how to transfer NARM into a group setting. Mm -hmm. And I remember being told by one of my teachers, and I'm sure I was told multiple times, but it only stuck when I was told by this one teacher. She said, Pete, you know, you only have one job. And if you do it well, you'll be fine. And she said, stay curious and provide structure. Mm -hmm. If you can do those two things, don't worry about the rest. 
And Mm -hmm. every single group I go into, that's what I do now. And it helps me calm down and it helps me help the group, not make the group, right? Mm, Yeah. And what you're naming here is such a foundational piece of NARM is the, the curiosity and that that in and of itself can create the container as we model that, you know, model the curiosity in a group. And yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, I'm curious in a remaining time if there's anything else you'd like to share, anything that you've learned on your journey and maybe how you've contacted NARM and what that's done for you or done for any clients. I think the thing that I love most about NARM, because I, <laughs> I've, I've had a couple of people in my cohort at school be like, yeah, we know Pete, it's NARM. Like, Shut up. <laughs> I've gone to a couple of different trainings, uh, spiritual trainings, different modalities, things like that since I've started school and, and since I've kind of started down this journey. And I think the thing that I love most about NARM is that compared to other teachings, I don't really feel like there is a guru sense. I feel like NARM keeps the focus on the students and it keeps it on the lessons. And to me, that's when I started kind of being my own NARM hype guy. So many of these other classes I went to, and there was always this, uh, this little harem of people trying to get closer, you know, the, the class would end and then there'd be five or six people who would try and get closer to the teacher. And I was just like, eh, eh okay, that's not for me. Mm. But NARM never had that feel. And so I, I think if somebody's considering taking NARM, the focus is on how NARM produces folks with the tools that they can go out and help people in the most effective and kind ways. And, and that, that was what I was looking for. And that's what I got. So, Yeah. I resonate with that so much. I, I really appreciated the humility, you know, mm-hmm. in, in my NARM trainings, I, I just always appreciated um, the humility of those at the front of the room. Yeah. Like, you know, they're a human and they're in this experience with us and we're all learning together. And that, that kind of vibe really contributes to me wanting to be curious and like show the, the areas where I don't know, where I have to learn when the person at the front of the room is doing that and showing humility. That's been really impactful for me as well. So I appreciate that you named that because it, it does, it gives a different, it's helped me at least engage with the work and with my clients in a different way when I can, you know try to remember to be curious and that I don't have to know everything. I don't have to pressure myself to know everything. Right. For sure. Because I already put enough pressure on myself. (laughs) Don't we all? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, gosh, Peter, I so appreciate you taking the time with us today and wondered if you have anything to share in terms of if folks are interested in, in your unique experience and the work that you're doing, is there any way that folks can contact you? Yeah. I am just starting out in my, you know, clinical experience. So Mm -hmm. they are welcome to contact me online and feel free to reach out. I'm happy to talk. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Peter. This has just been really special to understand a little bit more about your journey and the unique pieces that you bring to this work. And I know that there's going to be folks that are listening to this who feel really supported in you sharing your journey. So thank you. Thank you, Emily. Appreciate your time. Thanks so much for joining us for today's episode. To find more about our guest and their work, check the show notes or visit us at narmtraining.com slash transforming trauma. If you're a licensed mental health professional working with complex trauma, we're excited to share with you about our upcoming NARM therapist trainings. Level two training is a clinical training where you will get trained in a comprehensive developmental framework and clinical approach for resolving the long-term impacts of ACEs and CPTSD. You will receive individualized support from a team of skilled and supportive trainers led by NARM senior faculty, Brad Kammer. Learn more about this training or reserve your spot by visiting www.narmtraining.com forward slash schedule. Thanks to Andrea Klunder and the Creative Imposter Studios for producing and editing, to Tori Essex for our album art, and to Brad Kammer for the creation of this podcast. We look forward to building community, connection with you, and changing the world by transforming trauma.